Okay, so here we are. Um, if you saw the announcement and you're on uh, the City Gates announcements, if you're not on City Gates announcements, which is an announcement, WhatsApp announcement to the whole church, please get on there. Thank you, Earl. So you can get up to speed with the things that are happening, like Marcus Herbert preaching uh, today. But um, unfortunately, Marcus, I actually didn't even have my phone with me. We were also on home group duty. And um, Christoph, as I arrived, said, did you get your message, Marcus, the plane, um, he, was, because he was coming out of, they've had a vision weekend in Cornerstone, and he was flying in literally for our three o'clock today to finish off our leader's time. And he said, the, he's literally sitting in the airplane, and the, they can't close the door. And so he spent an hour and a half on the tarmac, and then we just, and, and they were going to take it, they, they, disembarked and then they, they were going to come back at five. We said, no, don't worry, we'll, we'll take it away. So it's interesting. <laughs> so, so when, so this morning, that, so, so this is, this is why, isn't this so exciting? I mean, this is what we live for. This is what we've been trained for 25 years. Have you got that preach in your pocket? Eh? Who's making eye contact? Yeah, no. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Christoph, a bit slow there. Yeah, so Rory, you're up. Eh? <laughs> I fling my cap there. Let me just put my cap on. You know what I mean? Yeah, don't worry about the lemons. But it's just, it's just wonderful. It's, I just love it because in just the course of my very relaxed morning, just going about my house, doing a few things, the Holy Spirit just whispered, I wonder what, you, what will you do if Marcus doesn't pitch up? <laughs> and, and, I said, and immediately I just thought, Psalm 91. And there, was a, there was a brief thought at some point this morning, right? In this heat, we actually wanted to give, and we will give it, it's, it's not going to be a surprise, but I really, it was in a prayer meeting last week, God spoke about keys. Jesus is the key. It's such a beautiful Thing that I think God is going to give. So what, one of the ideas was that we were going to give you each a key today with a nice leather story, but there was never, we were never going to pull that off in the short time from the idea to now. So we did try. I mean, I had about 60 keys on my table at some point this morning, but then we thought, you know what, let's just, let's just give ice lollies. And with a message like this, what's the message, uh, Gabriel? What was the message? Okay, Gabriel... Uh, Dasa, what was the message? Chill out. God's got your back. And so that's my message, our message today for you. Chill out. God has got your back. And let's go to Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So that song we did, Christoph, number two, that's the one you wrote, right? Psalm? 34. 34. Sounded a lot like Psalm 91. Huh? You can do that. Because you have, you have written one in 91. Sure. But you weren't in tune with the Spirit today. <laughs> Told you why. Yeah. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. You know, there's, a, there's this a very important, and it kind of leads off what I was saying during the worship. Just my interaction with my friend yesterday, just the sense that He is our most high. He is our most treasured. There's the sense that it's not once that you live with Jesus as your king. You live with him when he's your king. When you see him, it's like, it's like, it's like I'm absolutely desperate to be, I, I'm, I want to be a good dad to my children. But ultimately, the greatest prize for me is when my children get to that space, they say, I met with Jesus. I see him now as the most high. 
Because there's, he is only worthy of a worship. You can't start worshiping Jesus for the rest of your life until you've actually seen him as the most high God. We, compete with, we live in a world competing for every single space of our brain. It's the devil's way to distract you from acknowledging that he is the most high God. We live in the space where he's the most high. He is the creator God. In Psalm 91, we know as we go through this, he's a God that protects us. The reason we can trust him to protect us because he's the creator of all things seen and unseen, as it says in Colossians. I created everything that you can see, everything that you can't see, I created. And what does that mean? It means the devil was also created. And I want to ask you, are you living today with a big devil, small God, or big God, small devil? And there's a simple answer. What is every response to every single one of your situations? Big God, small devil, or big devil, small God? He is a massive God who created. When he looks at the enemy, he shakes, he laughs at the enemy. He's a created being. He is absolutely no match for a creator of everything. And yet so often we, we make these, we live this small life thinking God is a small God who doesn't know the exact situation and circumstance that you are in right now. And today, if anything, is evidence of that. Marcus is plain didn't come. It doesn't matter. We already had a message lined up. Chill out. God's got your back. He's got my back. He's always got my back. Doesn't matter what situation you find. Doesn't matter what's going to happen to me. If you will make him your Lord, if you acknowledge him as the most high, he's always got your back. It's good. Let's carry on and just read the whole song and come back to it. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions or his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your God. You have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague shall come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, let, let you strike, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot, because he holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. We had a season a while back in church where a, a man from Australia came and spoke through the psalm and was saying how God just started speaking about feathers. Because he says here, I cover you with my feathers. And what happened is everybody in the church just started finding feathers every day. And Nikki and I were, were still in our old house at the time. And I remember just praying through something, praying through some difficult stuff and asking God just for his sign again that he's with us and honest. And I remember getting into my car the next day. And my car at that time was parked outside. And right in front of me was a feather on my, wind, on my windscreen, you know? I mean, a, a light, a feather that can be blown like, like that. And as I get into my car, there's a feather. And we had a season where people were finding feathers in the, in the dishwasher and feathers everywhere. And it's something that as I've gone on my morning walks as well, I've, uh, I, I've, I feel every time I see a feather, I feel I, I pick it up and I go to the next person and I say to them, excuse me, ma'am, or excuse me, sir, I just want to, I've got a feather for you. I know it's going to, might sound a little bit strange, you don't know me, but I just want to tell you, Psalm 91, God's got your back. And I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are or how much money you might have or how powerful you think you are, 
I mean, I think we often look at so many other people, we think, oh, well, that person's got a right, that person's got enough money, that person stays in a safe house, that person seems to just have everything together. You know what? Nobody has got it together. Everybody needs to know your dad's got your back. Even if you've had a great biological father, as great as I can be for my kids, I'm faulty, and they need to know that there's a big God who's got their back. And, I, and, I, and, and when I'm speaking to some of the guys and trying to express that, I, I immediately think of some of these videos I see on Facebook with these chickens. Have you ever seen a mother, mother chicken care uh, when a snake comes for, for her babies? And she just, she wraps them, she wraps her feathers around her babies. And that snake actually can't even get through those feathers. Those feathers protect her. But she is fearless, like a lioness with her cubs. The snake will come. As the snake comes for you, as the, de- as the enemy comes for you, the Father in heaven covers you with his angelic feathers. And he's got your back. And this is a space where, where, where it's a hard space to trust him when you've got stuff in front of you. But that's the only place. That's why we live radically for God. Because, the, because you get stronger and stronger in trusting God. Faith is like a muscle. And we say many times, you're not going to have, you're not going to come and understand Jesus and have big faith, a, a, a spiritual six pack, as we've been saying this weekend. But with one meeting with God, it's a walk with Him daily. It's a walk in community. It's a learning and a discipling process where your muscles, your spiritual faith increases so that you start with a seed in the ground. Breaking through the, the hard times, sustaining yourself with the spirit of the word, and growing and growing and growing into a big tree that the birds of the air can come and rest in you because you become so full of faith. And you stand. A tree will always stand. A tree is immovable. God wants to plant you in city gate. I really want to mean that God wants to plant you here so that you can nourish and grow and become unshakable and immovable. A tree will never move in the face of fear. Never. A tree's not going to move. It can be burnt down, cut down. It can be, it can be blasted up. But a tree never moves. That's, that's what God says. We, we are planted on the rock. We should be these immovable rocks that stand against the enemy and, and laugh at fear. As Jesus says, I laugh at you because he's the creator of all things. I remember those early days, and I want to say those early days when you're coming into the faith, the devil knows you've got all, you've got good seed in you, and in your heart you have the seed, and the devil wants to snatch it away from you, and he'll scare you. He'll come at night in dreams. He'll come sometimes where he feels like he's clutching at your throat, intimidating you. And have you been there where you just say one word, Jesus? One word, Jesus, in the middle of the night and watch the enemy flee. He cannot stand With that word. You can talk about God all you want. You can go into anywhere you want to talk about God. The moment you mention Jesus, the whole atmosphere gets electric because the spiritual realm reacts to that and the demons react to Jesus. They cannot stand in his presence. Dare they come against the one. If he is for you, who can be against you? You will not fear the terror of the night. I just have a real conversation for you with yourself. If you are honestly in fear, take the, you, we have to come to this. Uh, we, either God is the creator of everything that we can see and can't see. He is the creator of all the angels. And remember, thir- even that third of the angels rebelled. Well, two-thirds are on your side. I mean, we've won this war left, right, and center. But God is so committed to our journey of decision because he's a lover. He can't do this for us because otherwise it's not love. Love demands that you choose and I choose. When you got married and you fell in love, the reason you felt so alive was because she chose you or he chose you. If if you'd forced that person to choose you, if you'd manipulated that person and, and used your strength and your power to make them choose you, there would be no love there. I mean, do we get that? So that's why God sometimes restrains himself. You think, why is this happening? He's he's wanting you to say. He's wanting you to choose him in faith and say, I'm going to trust you even though I'm scared. It's okay to be scared. I'm not saying it's not okay to be scared. I'm just saying when you're scared, stand. Stand on his rock.
A thousand may fall by your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. See, there's, there's what he says. He says, because you have made the Lord. He hasn't made you his dwelling place. You have made him your dwelling place. It's a decision of your will. That's how it works. It's a decision of your will. It's by your will that you were here today. And that unlocks the spiritual realm for God to speak to you. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague will come near your tent. One of my good friends, Wayne, I don't know if you remember, a few years back, we see him often in the coffee shop here. He's a, he's a water man. He loves the ocean. He's a wild man. Christians should be wild, not weird, wild. We should be wild. We don't have to be weird. We can be different, 100%, and God, God, God he, he expresses his creativity in our differences. We're not weird, but we are absolutely wild. And we sometimes are a little bit dangerous, and sometimes because people are a bit nervous to join that church. And he's one of these wild men. And he went with his mate down, you remember Jason, and they were praying on the beach, in the Durban beachfront there. And it's good, it's just such a good thing for us. Have you got that one person that you're praying with at the moment? It changed my life in my early days as a believer because I was a little bit also, a bit all over the place. You know, I had my two good mates that we started to pray together and I was all over the place and they were taking God seriously and, and I actually just had that moment in the prayer where I said, what am I doing here? How, how, how dishonoring is it for me to come stand in the presence of two of my friends who are taking Jesus seriously and I'm playing games. It's that accountable, prayerful relationship that keeps us. That's why, that's why Jesus had the three. And so they were praying together on the beachfront and Jason just said to Wayne, he said, Wayne, I feel Psalm 91 for you. And Wayne is an enthusiastic guy. I went back that night with his kids and his wife. He says, hey guys, let's go through Psalm 91 at the kitchen table and they went through Psalm 91. Next day he went, he was, doing, he was doing one of these races, I think he was running, a, he was a trail runner, and so he wanted a, a, a cell phone, he wanted a, a, just a second-hand cell phone, because he didn't want to take his fancy, he went up the mountain, and he went to one of these shops, bought a second-hand cell phone, he switched on the welcome message was Psalm 91. He's going to visit a a, a, a lawyer for a business, a, a business meeting that week, and a taxi comes past him, Psalm 91. She's thinking, wow, I'm seeing Psalm 91, what's going on here? Anyway, he gets into his boat. He paddles, he paddles those surf skis. He, gets, he, got, he decides to go alone, never a great idea, out to the shark, past the shark net to the boy. You know the boy, the, the boy right out there, I don't know, two k's out with the, where all the ships kind of target, they kind of wait there before they line up for the harbor. So he reckons he's going to go out there. He's literally two k's out, on his way back, and a shark just smacks the bottom of his boat. Bam! Big hole. And now he's two k's out at sea, alone in his boat, and as he's, and he's paddling very fast because his energy's just gone through the roof. I mean, he's just pumping like this, going very fast, but as he, the faster he's going, that boat's just going lower and lower and lower. In fact, it was getting so low that by the time he got to the shark nets, I mean, he almost got stuck on the, on the shark net trying to get over. And um, he got back, loaded up his boat, went home. His aunt came past, heard what had happened, and said to him, you were protected by Psalm 91. Anyway, he got into the front page of the newspaper with his big boat. But this is the reality, this God that just knows what's going to happen. He's a God that knows. He's one of the defining, the reason why I re read the Bible, one of the many reasons is it's the only book that's prophetic. It's the book, it's the only book in this world that tells us what happens in the future. There's no other book in the world. How many 
Marokin was telling us how many prophecies there are and the statistical chance of Jesus actually being raised on the dead, uh, raised from them. The statistical chances of Jesus fulfilling all those prophecies in his resurrection. It's beyond impossible because it's true. This is a book. God defines himself. He proves himself by his ability to know the future. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. There's a sense that we have to have this. We we need to know that we are part of a supernatural journey with God. There are angels around here. And maybe some of you say, well, I want to see an angel. And there are those people that say they can see angels. You know, the truth is that whether you see an angel or you don't see an angel, even if you said you see an angel, you're still going to need to have faith that that was an angel that you saw. You know? It's like when I told those guys the story about my friend who who was going down the river, and and I'm not going to tell the whole story, but literally he was about to die, and, and, and God's hand pulled him through the car, through the river, and when they saw the car the next day, it says it's impossible he was pull, pulled through the car because everything was locked. Well, well, he was pulled through the car. He's a farmer from the north coast there. You know, farmers don't lie. <laughs> and he stood in front of the whole school, this whole bunch of boys telling them the story. And the boys just said, oh, you know, sir, I don't believe that guy. And I said, well, even if Jesus came here today and he told you I'm the son of God, you guys wouldn't believe him. And as I said that, I realized, oh, well, he's already done that. So even if Jesus pitched up today from, what's a small town? Where, what's that small town? Where's your small town where you came from, American? No, not the other one. Portable. If I came here from Portable, say, I, I am God. Which is easier for me to do, to say your sins are forgiven or to stand up and walk, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, I say stand up and walk. You'll say, you'll say who's this lunatic from Portable? So the thing is, like, it's a step of faith, but it's a faith that God, but, it, but He knows your heart. And if you will come to him today and say, I want to believe, he will prove himself to you, to you, in ways that will blow your mind, just as he did today. Like today, I mean, how can we, how can we put this day? We, but this happens every Sunday. Mark is not here. Okay, well, we already had the message. Chill out. God's got your back. Psalm 91. When he calls to me, some, uh, some, uh, stroke, uh, stroke, I'm not playing golf here. Verse 15, when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor, honor him. You know, I want to say this, hey, God answers our prayers. And I reckon Part of the journey with God is that you just have increased belief. Your faith gets stronger that he answers prayers. Marikin has got, we still need to hear some of her testimonies about God answering prayers. There's a grace on her life around prayer. It's been the most delightful blessing to this church to have someone who's got real unbelievable testimonies of how God answers prayers. But I can tell you, over the last couple of months, I had a situation in, in a business situation that Everything in my flesh wanted to resolve this in a fleshly way, and in a very unhelpful fleshly way. And on two, two times where I'd kind of come to the end of myself and said, now I'm going to really, really, really pray. Not that I, like now I'm like, you know, and it's just, it's like, God, like, do you actually see me? And that's okay. Like, like, I'm, like I, I'm almost petulant with the way I'm speaking to him. What on earth is going on here? I want to go and do some things that I know I shouldn't do. I need you then to break through. And the reality is that because God says to us that our fight is not of flesh and blood, because he said to us, do not use flesh and blood, he must answer your prayers. Otherwise, you're going to go into flesh and blood. Isn't that right? If he doesn't answer these prayers, we have to. Because if there's unrighteous situations, 
And literally, I mean, I got on my knees and I prayed, this guy that's been holding this thing that is mine, it's my asset, and he won't let it go. Every time, the next day, suddenly, out of nowhere, God answers our prayers. I want to say God answers our prayers. And sometimes it's an answer that you might not want to hear. Really. Sometimes we've just lost a friend. He was so in faith for the healing of his wife that he was so in faith till the time she died. Young lady died. He was in faith. God didn't didn't answer the prayer that he wanted to answer, but he did answer the prayer because she's with God now. And we actually have got to understand we are his children. When you go home, you know how I miss my kids after two weeks? Some of you haven't seen your daddy for 71 years who's ever 71 today. From that day you're born, you still haven't run into your daddy's arms. Your daddy in heaven is waiting to hug you. Can you imagine your dad in heaven He's waiting to hug you and embrace you? So if, if you go to see your dad at 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 80 years, it's the greatest hug you're ever going to get because we never lose this battle. Even when the worst thing that can happen, we might die. We win and we win and we win. We have to surrender to the reality that he is the sovereign God in charge of everything. He is building his church. He is going forward in South Africa. South Africa will be redeemed. I don't know when, but it will including Africa, including Zimbabwe, he will do what he can do because he's the creator of the universe. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this time. I just want to say, Christoph, maybe you can play the, your, your Psalm 34 there. Or actually, can you play Psalm 91? Father, we thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that you invite us to test you in, in a right way, not in a wrong way. Let me, let me say that a different way. I don't think I said that the right way. You invite us to trust you, Jesus. And you're so excited when we trust you that you immediately answer us. And so Jesus, Jesus, Christoph plays the song that he wrote, Psalm 91. Christoph wrote this song. In your presence, he wrote this song. I pray, Father, right now that we can all chill. Those of us that are living in anxiety, those of us that are wondering, when is my next job? When is my next paycheck coming? Those of us concerned about the future and the plans that you have. I just ask you, Lord, that you just minister. Minister to our hearts that we would be free children always trusting you, always just with a, with a smile on our face, even though our circumstances might not seem great, because you're our daddy, and you've got our back. And if that's you today, and you feel like, oh, I just, I want this. You know what? Just open your heart to, to the Spirit of God, and, and let Him Take a step of obedience. I really mean that. Take a step. Let him let the Spirit speak to you and, and just obey what he's saying. Because sometimes we need to, if we're going to be real about doing business with God, it's only evident in, in our obedience to what he says we, we should do. Because what he's going to do, he's going to take you probably to a place of healing. And in order to go to a place of healing, often requires surgery and some pain. But it's, it's there's freedom on the other side. So, so, so in this space, just as Christoph prays, I, I, I really ask you, when the Spirit maybe invites you to do something, it, don't say it's my brain telling me to do this, it's the Holy Spirit telling you. Because He wants to heal you. 